Hello, uh, my name is Vladislav Zubok. I'm professor of international history at LSC, and I will moderate a debate. Uh, um, uh, the topic is uh, uh, what happened to fascism in Ukraine and Russia. This is the first debate uh, organized by uh, the program Russian International Affairs at LSC Ideas. Uh, my uh, guests today and also participants of, uh, of uh, today's workshop on nationalism in Europe and Russia uh, I will start with uh, 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 Dr. Uh, uh, Georgi Kasyanov uh, from the Institute of Ukrainian History, Kiev, Ukraine. Then Katriona Kelly, Professor of History, Oxford University. And uh, Igor Torbakov, uh, Center for uh, uh, Russian and Eurasian Studies, University of Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, let me start with uh, one observation. Uh, why, why fascism? You know, because fascism or Nazism is, is the term that keeps floating in, in, in uh, propaganda campaigns and media as we look at, uh, at the unfolding crisis uh, about Ukraine. Uh, I should start with two uh, quotations from uh, two articles of the same historian, uh, Timothy Snyder. In uh, February 2010, Timothy Snyder published an article um, uh, in, uh, in the prestigious American uh, journal, the New York Review of Books, saying that the new incoming government uh, in Kiev will face a serious problem of, of uh, 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 nat nationalist Nazi legacy, saying essentially that uh, Stepan Bandera uh, was the only symbol of uh, Ukrainian national independence or struggle for Ukrainian in national independence in Ukraine. And any government in Kiev would have to deal with this, if you like, fascist narrative, how to make a fascist a hero. And the previous government of Ukraine, the government of uh, Yushchenko, uh, even authorized directing statues to Stepan Bandera, who was from the viewpoint of many, many people, um, Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians, really a fascist, a collaborant with Nazi Germany. Uh, and just recently in March this year, the same uh, historian, Timothy Snyder, uh, rejected his own claim that there's a problem of fascism in Ukraine. In fact, he pointed that the Kremlin claims that they are fascists in Western Ukraine is pure propaganda. That in, in he even asked rhetorically, why exactly do people with such views, he talks, uh, talked about uh, uh, Kremlin uh, propagandists, uh, think they can call other people fascists? And why does anyone on the Western left take them seriously? So uh, my first question would be to uh, uh, Georgi Kasyanov. When people say fascists in Ukraine, uh, in Western Ukraine, in Crimea, in, in, in Kiev, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, what kind of images come up in their mind and what kind of uh, politics of memory uh, we can discuss with regard to this? Well, uh, it depends on the region. Uh, when we speak about Crimea or eastern uh, regions of Ukraine, people would say, when they say fascists, they would say uh, they would mean uh, something from the World War II and uh, they would mean Germans, uh, uh, Nazis. Uh, they would speak about uh, occupation and there is a lot of different connotations which are uh, related to certain historical experience and of course to uh, Soviet time uh, propaganda. When they would uh, speak about Bandera, uh, they would speak about extreme nationalism and of course since they uh, already objected to this kind of Russian propaganda, they would call him uh, fascist. When you will speak to the people from Western Ukraine, uh, you would hear that uh, uh, it's national hero and, uh, and that he was, uh, uh, he was jailed in, uh, uh, by Nazis, that he spent uh, uh, well, five years in Polish prison because he was fighter for independence of Ukraine. And then he spent uh, four years in a Nazi camp, a concentration camp. Then if you go back to Moscow, you, they will uh, tell you that uh, Bandera spent four years in the VIP cell in, in uh, 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 German camp. And uh, they uh, hold him for special uh, political and uh, military purposes. So there is a lot of different images, dif different perceptions. And generally, if uh, we go into uh, Ukrainian context, intellectual and historical context, the word uh, 
fascist and fascist the words fascist and fascism uh, it's a kind of uh, abuse uh, political abuse of uh, words so it would not be used I believe would not be used in academic discourse and academic discussions if we speak about so-called Ukrainian fascists of nowadays we would speak about right-wing nationalists or extreme nationalists whatever but since you if anybody would use word fascist it means that uh, you use a political labels and you are out of academic discussion but you know for some people particularly those uh, with uh, Jewish background mm -hmm. or some Polish background those Poles who had to clash with uh, the own the armies of Bandera mm -hmm. these memories are still very painful <laughs> uh, because they were there were many people killed in that war within war between the Ukrainian you know, nationalists and the Poles on one hand and within Ukrainian nationalists and other Ukrainians who served in the Red Army. What would you tell to these people mm -hmm. how this uh, plays out in their memories? Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's a serious problem because, uh, well, first of all, any historical memory or any discussion is heavily instrumentalized by politicians. Uh, and they use it for different political ends. Of course, uh, uh, the organization which is called fascist, uh, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, it's, is responsible for ethnic cleansings in uh, Western Ukraine, for killings, mass killings of Poles. They are also, uh, uh, well, we're involved, they were involved into extermination of Jews by, well, in well, different ways. Uh, however, um, we speak about when we speak about these things about nationalist fascist etc we do not speak about uh, we don't speak about uh, people do not speak about uh, real things they speak about symbols for instance if you ask uh, well ardent uh, uh, pro bandera uh, guy who was bandera he will say you that uh, well he was a fighter for independence and they would ask him for details you would not have details so people are operating with symbols, not with a uh, well concrete historical material. I mean ordinary people. But uh, of course, if uh, if I would uh, uh, discuss your question about Poles and Jews and uh, their th their thoughts about responsibility of uh, nationalists, and then. We would go to nowadays uh, to a contemporary situation and would speak about instrumentalization of memory. Then we will see that uh, the term fascist is used extensively and in many cases with no uh, particular address. Uh, I would also add that when um, uh, previous political, uh, uh, previous power, I mean Yanukovych, Yanukovych and his company, they also extensively used the term fascism and anti-fascism. They have orchestrated their political campaigns against uh, Ukrainian uh, idea, Ukrainian idea in general, not about as a, a extreme Ukrainian nationalism, uh, as anti-fascist campaigns. So uh, the term itself is truly corrupted politically. So if you would speak about this phenomena and he would speak and would discuss the responsibility of uh, right-wing nationalists for different black deeds in the past. We should use the most correct terms, not fascist, right-wing nationalist, extreme nationalist, integral nationalism, whatever. But fascism is uh, misleading. All right, all right. But we see how, how, uh, how much it is used by, by the Kremlin propaganda of and course. does resonate. It leads me to another question that I want to ask uh, uh, Igor Torbakov. Uh, we know that uh, years before the current crisis over Ukraine, um, history was in the focus uh, of uh, not only historians, but other people than historians. And we can talk even about historical wars or memory wars on the territory of the former Soviet bloc, uh, involving Poland, involving Ukraine, uh, Russia, the Baltic states, Georgia, and so on and so forth. Uh, could you please comment on how these memory wars may have contributed to the current crisis? And at one point, Russia, Russia as a state, or Russians as historians, people who are interested in history, joined these, wa these wars. Well, from my point of view, and um, actually uh, we discussed this uh, theme a little bit uh, during our workshop today, 
uh, Russians uh, were the kind of latecomers to uh, this uh, war of memories or history wars. Maybe you should comment a little bit how do you view the war of memories? What, what kind of war it was? Who was you know, fighting whom? Well, basically, uh, I think it really uh, originated uh, uh, sometime um, around the beginning of 2000s and uh, normally it would concern uh, some uh, dates of uh, commemoration, uh, like uh, the uh, certain anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the anniversaries of the beginning and the end of the Second World War. And uh, it's clear that the perception of what, uh, say, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact meant for certain countries and uh, certain peoples dramatically differ. We know that, for instance, the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was not recognized you know, during the entire Soviet period. I mean, and the documents which were kept uh, in the Soviet archives were kept secret. I mean, they well, were, secret they were, protocols were not yeah, found. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, although, where I think, and if uh, my memory serves me correctly, and if it doesn't, you know, you correct me, uh, they were published you know, back in like, 1948 uh, by, by, by the State Department, but still, right. you know, Russians, the, the, the Soviet authorities, Soviet authorities, the Soviet, yeah, 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 like yeah, 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 no, no, the Soviet authorities. Why they did it, you think? You know, what's, are we sitting today in 2014, why it took so long for them to recognize? Was it too traumatic? Was it working against Soviet state interests? How would you define it? Well, uh, I would say that obviously uh, the uh, recognition of what had happened would work against the, the interests of the Soviet state because uh, the Soviet state acted. It's basically like a grass. I mean, it was part to a very, very unholy lives that produced a very, very nasty deal, you know, leading to the you know, division of Europe and, and basically leading to the Partition of Poland and so on. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what do you think? Because most of the post-war uh, period, the consensus uh, in the Soviet Union was based on the idea the Soviet Union won the war against fascism, and the word fascist was used all the time. So the Soviet mm -hmm. Union was the leader of the anti-fascism in the world. And some historians even believe today that we're seeing the crumbling of that anti-fascist consensus because the Soviet Union is gone and, and so on. So it's a complicated process. But you think also ideologically, uh, during all those decades, uh, fascism and anti-fascism were for, for people who grew up in the Soviet Union sort of moral absolutes. If you were fighting against fascists, that meant you know, you, you, you're a beacon of progress. Um, so uh, it was difficult to acknowledge that actually the Soviet Union collaborated actively with so-called fascists. Mm -hmm. I, 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 would, I would completely agree. I would completely agree because uh, not only the fighting, uh, the uh, um, Nazi fascism, gave the Soviet Union the high moral ground, but the victory of fascism gave the Soviet Union a huge geopolitical stake in Europe and actually uh, would allow the Soviet authorities to cast themselves as the liberators of Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's basically when the Soviet Union collapsed and the truth appeared and you know, started being discussed, this lofty image of the victors of a fascism and of the liberators of at least half of Europe actually created, the discrowning of the Smith created, you know, huge problems. Because uh, I would say that what had happened you know, after the Smith's crumble, you know, led to the, the competition between the kind of two images of liberation. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when the uh, Western allies, you know, liberated the Western part of Europe, this liberation was associated 
with bringing to these parts of the world democracy, rule of law, but nothing of that kind happened after the Soviet Union liberated and at the same time conquered so that part of the one world. One thing I don't understand then, why Russia was a late comer to the memory wars? Was it in denial before or just silent, sulking in the corner while other countries such as Poland and Ukraine and the Balts said you actually collaborated with uh, Hitler and then you, you occupied us in 1939-40 and then you came again in 1944-45 and occupied us. You don't have you, you you have none of this more high moral ground associated with anti-fascism because you are part of that totalitarian phenomenon yourselves. Why Russians didn't react to that? I mean, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the new Russian state. Well, I, I think that you know, first of all, uh, immediately after the collapse uh, uh, of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, most Russians, including the Russian authorities, were preoccupied uh, with you know something you know different, I mean, with uh, uh, you know, economic dislocation, with you know all sorts of crises. But uh, that period was also uh, very interesting in a sense that, again, until the uh, the end of the nineteen nineties, beginning beginning of uh, the two thousands. I think the uh, Russian leadership still hoped for some sort of integration, if not in the West, but you know, with the West, some sort of a more or less amicable relationship. And that obviously affected uh, their attitude towards uh, the, the so-called memory wars. You know, after the end of the 1990s, you know, after the you know, US bombings of you know, Yugoslavia, which, mm. as you know so well, uh, was badly received right. in and the, the crowd. wave of anti-Americanism and anti-NATO feelings Ab rose Absolutely, it was, it, was, it was constantly on the rise. And then the you know, US-Iraq campaign. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it really leads us to the time, you know, approximately, of the, the, the mid-2000s, and, and then, you know, 2005, that was a crucial year because that was a kind of big anniversary at the end of the war, so uh, the, that was the year when uh, the most of Eastern Europe uh, became part of both NATO and the right. EU, and these new countries, these new entrants, Brought and this is when it began. Exactly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, when they became the members of the EU, they brought into the EU something which there wasn't before. Because they they, they start claiming that their traumatic experiences during the war and during the Soviet occupation on the hands of the Germans and the Russians. Uh, absolutely be included mm -hmm. into the pan-European narrative mm -hmm. of the war. And they behave very aggressively in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have uh, also, this raises a question of almost, you know, age and generation. I know, I know that uh, Professor Kelly, you studied uh, Soviet youth and just education and youth in general, many other subjects, of course. You, you would imagine that such a topic, you know, fascist, would, would, would make older people ag agitated, but mm -hmm. we, we see actually new Russia 20 something years after the collapse of so Soviet Union with completely new people, young Russians being involved in this discussion. Uh, what kind of situation exists among young Russians you, you, you find? Um, how do they react, if ever, to this rhetoric? in the Kremlin and, uh, and, and how do they react to uh, memories of World War II? Well, I think you need to um, be careful of overgeneralizing because after all, there were a lot of young people in Russia and the former Soviet Union and they come from different social groups. There were very different levels of education. I mean, it's largely a highly educated population sort of by international comparators. But at the same time, obviously that makes people dependent on the education that they get and dependent also on the kind of information that they're getting out of the internet, which people in um, Western Europe and America are 
perhaps over inclined to take as a liberating force. I mean, mm. I don't think that they always recognize just how much the internet can reinforce perceptions that people already have, because a lot of it works by selection of a group and excluding others. I mean, in other words, the gesture of unfriending people on social websites is a kind of way of creating these groups. I mean, I should emphasize that I'm not a specialist in youth culture in the way that, say, Hilary Pilkington at mm -hmm. the University of Manchester is, and she's done participant observation with very specific groups, groups on the radical right. I mean, skinhead groups, for instance, and Sebastian Job, um, who's an Australian academic, has also worked with such groups. And I mean, I couldn't say that I'd done anything other than sort of um, observe longer distance, but I would say two things. I mean, one of which is, of course, everybody's memory depends partly on family memory. And so people <coughs> in Russia, at least, and I, I suspect the same is true of Ukraine. I mean, there's been really quite a lot of memoirs that have made clear, I mean, Lyudmila Alexeyevna's memoirs, for example, that make, make clear that people didn't go through the sort of same generational conflict. They were much more likely to trust their parents' views of yeah, things. It depends on what family uh, of course, you but belong I mean, to, what in you read, what kind of social... In, in, in edu educated families right. in the Soviet period. And there were certain perceptions, and it was quite interesting, no matter how alternative people were in other cultural terms, that they tended to sort of assume that part of the um, Soviet perception of the war was right. And, um, and one of the things, of course, that people learned about the war in the Soviet, cu Soviet culture was that it was really the Soviet Union which had been the only anti-fascist agent. I mean, you know, just to give an anecdote, I remember once being told by um, a mildly drunken taxi driver that, I mean, you know, he said when he found out there was a party of people from Britain and Austria in, in, in the back of his taxi, he said, well, England and Austria are wonderful countries, but the only trouble is that neither of them took part in the war. <laughs> and that was a kind of quite, I think, telling observation on the level of knowledge. And the other thing that's important, I mean, we all know in the West that fascist is used as a term of abuse for people from the radical right, and it wouldn't, in the same way, it wouldn't be used by respectable academics because it's much too loaded a term, it's not revealing, it doesn't say anything about the differences between these groups, what their actual programmes are. But I think we're not familiar with it as a World War II expression. I mean, you know, it's generic, it's probably used about Italians rather than Germans. And we're certainly not familiar with the hyphenated form fas fascist zahwetchiki, so mm -hmm. people who invaded and conquered, and I think that's sort of something. So in other words, you've got a reinforcement pattern here, which is that if fascists are not just people who will have extremely unpleasant views, who are on the wrong side in the war, they're also people who are aggressively determined to take over the culture. And that, I think, is quite common to sort of broad strands of um, Russian and other post-Soviet societies. You can see why. Um, and it colours their perception of particular, as I say, radical right groups. Well, uh, to, to, to pick on what you just said about the internet, and the, we've seen mm -hmm. uh, Russia being really very, uh, very well educated mm -hmm. country. You see increasing number of people, I don't know how many, 50% or over 50% using internet regularly yes. or not regularly. Uh, you would expect that these people are exposed to a variety of views. They're also free to travel abroad for the first time. Yes. In, in, in the history of this part of the world, uh, how does it, you know, are these people less susceptible to nationalist cliches, you think, or what kind of nationalism uh, exists today in Russia? Well, one thing that Hillary and her Russian partners, including Yelena Amyenchenko, discovered in one of their surveys was that um, young people who had visited the West were more likely to be anti-Western. I mean, this was just in a sort of, you huh. know, it, it seems counterintuitive. We heard about some is, uh, Islamic uh, uh, fellows who yes. had the same kind of strange reaction I mean, to the West. These these um, these studies go back several years, but I mean, it certainly, uh, if you imagine the circumstances in which quite a number of young people are likely to go to the West, that they go on a package tour, um, they stay in a hotel, probably a t hotel which is quite low cost, they go around in groups, and essentially what they see is you know, sort of expensive cafes, which they may not like very much. They may not speak the language very confidently so that they then find themselves kind of, you know, the target of rudeness in, um, you know, foreign metro stations. We've all been through it. And I think it's also a bit like, I mean, you know, I can just about remember when Britain was like this also, that people were really quite anxious about going abroad. They went to, you know, tea like mother made cafes with chips in um, southern Spain. I mean, you know, they didn't want to go to places that sort of pre presented them with an alien experience. And so again, foreign travel can be about re reinforcement. And I'm not saying that there's anything to do with actual radical right views, because I think that another thing that I would say about modern Russia, and I, I again suspect this is true about other parts of the post-Soviet world, is that people's views can be extremely contradictory. And another 
way that I bring that out is that European, Europejski is a term of consummate praise. You can't see anything sort of which is better, really. I mean, from anything from house decoration to kind of, you know, the latest type of political or philosophical view, the sort of type of education that's wanted. American doesn't work in the same way. I think there's a sort of undertow of anti-Americanism of a kind that's also found in other European countries. I mean, not including Britain to anything like the same extent. But alongside that is a kind of determination, I think, not to let Russia be swamped by the English language. Um, no, it's interesting when I watch Russia today, which doesn't happen often to me. Uh, no. I cannot get an overdose of this uh, this channel, no. but kind of uh, out of curiosity, I think. No. And they're all absolutely fluent, uh, uh, accentless young Russians uh, and non-Russians, uh, but working for this uh, Russian, you know, basically propaganda channel and repeating uh, some anti-American cliches or sometimes telling the real stories but giving it a twist and yes. a spin. The, you know, I wonder to what extent they believe in what they broadcast, or of course, or they just uh, work for their money. Well, and it's an impossible situation, isn't it? I mean, people dispute that with reference to the Soviet past as well. So one of the kind of biggest areas of academic argument at the moment is Soviet subjectivity. I mean, you know, did people in the 1930s who were writing in their diary that they wanted to transform their soul, that they wanted to kind of, you know, hammer it into sort of, you know, a, a weapon for kind of communist ideology. Did they actually mean that or did they know they were supposed to write things like that in their diary? Because that's what you did in a diary. They knew they were supposed to keep their diary mm. for a certain number of hours a day. I mean, is it because simply that it's a kind of question of putting butter on your bread, as it yeah. were? And yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, British journalists, I mean, you know, I sometimes wonder whether people in the tabloid press believe some of the stories they say, I mean, this is not to meant to be right, what aboutism. Right. It's, it's not to, a, meant to underestimate the control of the press. It's a long conversation. Since yes. we, we, we have to, yeah. to, to wrap up soon in five minutes, so yes. I would like to uh, focus our attention on um, how things you think would develop. And I'll start with Georgi Kasyanov. Are we seeing the, the rise of mutually exclusive narratives, uh, nationalist narratives, both in Ukraine and in Russia, or the situation is more complicated? Would, would it be too much to say that Ukrainians uh, would never forgive Russians for what happened uh, during the Ukrainian famine? Mm -hmm. Or Russians would never forgive Ukrainians for, the, for Bandera and what the Western Ukraine uh, did during the war? What, how this mutual, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mutual animosities based on painful memories can develop in your opinion? Well, uh, if you, you speak about Russians in Ukraine or about mm -hmm. Russians in Russia, when you speak As about you know, forgiveness... As Russians in Ukraine, Ukrainians in Russia, but you know, if mm -hmm. we talk about the conflict that becomes conflict between mm -hmm. states mm -hmm. now, can these complicated and multi-layered narratives be simplified simply because of pressure of the current crisis into mutually hostile and exclusive, exclusivist narratives, you know, in the, at, the, at another panel we discussed the Yugoslav scenario uh, that started with, uh, you know, with you know, the war of memories and ended up in genocidal, mm -hmm. you know, situations. Well, it's, uh, it's a question of uh, intensity of propaganda uh, and uh, intensity of inf informational wars. Uh, as far as I know, is as what I can judge from what I see uh, at Russian TV channels. Uh, Russians are winning, I mean Russian authorities, winning the uh, winning informational. What, hearts and minds? Uh, not hearts and minds, they're winning the, the battle, not the war. But winning <laughs> uh, with relation to whom? The Western audience? Uh, no, no, themselves? I mean, in, yes, in, no, no, th audience. themselves. Domestic themselves. audience? Yes, mm -hmm. they, they, uh, they managed to represent uh, Ukraine and events in Ukraine uh, for the last three months, or even uh, more, uh, as a uh, kind of feast of nationalism, and uh, uh, they represent uh, they present Russians in Ukraine as some part of population which is in danger, and uh, they did it successfully, unfortunately. Uh, Katriona, quickly about Western reactions, not about academics like Snyder or you, but do people, what do people think when they hear about uh, Ukrainian Nazis uh, what, uh, from, from Russian propaganda, from Russia today, uh, if they get this information in the West, in Britain, in other countries, what, 
how do they react? Well, to be honest, I think a lot of them just really don't more or less no. know where Ukraine is. I mean, there was a, there's a kind of entertaining program called Gogglebox, which takes ordinary viewers and asks about, th about them. And the classic reaction is one woman on it saying, I've got a friend in Urania. <laughs> Urania. Um, Urania. Urania, yes, yes. And I mean, not to mock it, because actually some of the people were coming out with perfectly adequate reactions. And I mean, you know, they were making um, their own statements about it, not necessarily always anti-Russian. But I mean, I think there are a lot of people for whom it's Urania. I mean, it might just as well be out there in the solar system somewhere. Russians and invade Urania. You know, yes. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's kind of, if it's interpreted at, at all, it's often interpreted in terms of the underdog. Um, and it's, you know, Ukraine is obviously in size terms the underdog, as it were. Um, and some people have been saying, well, you know, is it so different from Britain and Northern Ireland, which I, was, I would say that it is, because um, the ostensible reason for sending the troops into Northern Ireland was not to defend the British population there, but to defend part of the population that was supposed to be at threat um, because of the sort of civil rights movement and the way it's being put down at the time by the local police force. So it's a, a very different situation, but um, okay. who knows? Okay, Igor Torloko, very quickly, one minute. What, what would be your, your reaction to how you know th this is uh, winning? Winning the Russian media is winning the battle. Do you believe it? Uh, among whom? Uh, well, uh, I would say that if we uh, look at, at Shia numbers, uh, they would indicate that uh, approximately seventy percent of Russian support uh, Putin's policies towards Ukraine and uh, towards uh, Crimea. But uh, I would still say that, and, and agree with Georgi, that probably it's the process of winning the battle, but in long term, probably losing the war. Ah, losing hearts and minds of Ukrainians in the process, you would say well, that? Well, f f first that, that that's uh, undeniable. But what's more interesting is that inside Russia, the situation is more complicated. Yep. Because as I tried, tried to allude during today's mm -hmm. workshop, even amongst the Russian ethnic nationalists, mm -hmm. there are people who are supporting Ukrainians, mm. who yes. want to distance themselves from what they call a reckless Putin adventure. From their government. Yeah, from, yes. from their government, yes. because I, they, they think that what is happening would taint them. They actually admire Ukrainians. I mean, they are concerned about their brethren in the south and eastern parts of Ukraine. They want their uh, rights uh, being taken care of. Mm -hmm. they, they, they want that their rights, uh, including linguistic rights, are secured. But they also admire what they see in Ukraine as the triumph of people's power. They see yeah. how Ukrainians reclaimed the people's sovereignty. Uh, reclaiming which, their national honor. Absolutely, yes. which is sorely lacking in Russia. Uh, okay, on this note, uh, we have to finish. I'm Vladislav Zubok, uh, professor of international history, LSC, and this is a debate uh, organized in the framework of uh, the new program, Russia and International Affairs, and I thank uh, my guests today, Georgi Kasyanov, Katerina Kelly, and Igor Torbakov. Thank you. It was very good.